Hi everyone, welcome back to The Watch Insider. My name is Brian and thank you all for logging on tonight. I am joined by Tim Masso. Howdy guys. And we've got an exciting show filled with lots of interesting watches and uh, I think a little bit of news from Tim. Yes, absolutely. I will be at Watch Time New York this weekend on Saturday. This is actually the preview edition of the December copy. I get all sorts of cool stuff like that, but you can meet me, talk about watches. I'm going to be hosting a panel. We're going to have 37 superb brands, everything from Seiko and G-Shock all the way up to Grubel Forsey. And this is the place to try watches on. So Watch Time New York at Gotham Hall. Check out watchtime.com and get your tickets. They're still available. Friday night sold out. The main event on Saturday is not yet. Beautiful. So we've got some really cool watches on the table. Why don't we start from left to right? Uh, and while I get us going on the chat, because it doesn't look like you have your uh, laptop here nope, tonight. Nope, I'm, I'm winging it tonight. So guys, we're going to be talking about an FP Journe Resonance. Now the interesting thing about the Resonance is that it's arguably the second pillar of the FP Journe manufacture, alongside the Tourbillon Raymontoire and laterally the Tourbillon Souverain. The Resonance watch really is iconic of FP Journe, just as the combination of the Raymontoire de Galate Constant Force and Tourbillon was an original for FP Journe. The, and, Resonance wristwatch was also all of his own, as it was essentially a translation of clockmaker Antti Janvier's resonance phenomenon into a wristwatch format. Now, it's known that if you take two metronomes, or you take two pendulums, and you set them in close proximity, they will eventually synchronize to each other. F.P. Journe theorized during the 1980s that this same phenomenon could be utilized to operate in a wristwatch. His first attempt at a pocket watch watch using resonance did not work. His second attempt during the 90s in the wristwatch format did work, and this was the result. Now, this is not the original resonance that launched in the year 2000. This is a post-2004 example with the caliber 1499.2. The dot two means that it is in rose gold, and there have been profound changes to the bridges as well as the ratchet wheels. Those are aesthetic changes. Practically, it's the same mechanism as you have two escapements, two drivetrains, two barrels, and two balances. Now, they operate in close proximity, the idea being that the emanation of lost energy from the two escapements and two balances will mutually regulate. So if one runs fast, the other one will slow it down by resonance principle and vice versa. So they synchronize in about five to 10 minutes on the wrist. There is a little rack and pawl. As you can see, there is a spur or a pinion screw at center that drives a sort of rack on this secondary balance. And you can also see that there is a tension screw to fix the balance in place. And the watchmaker will adjust the proximity of these two balances to maximize the resonance effect. Now, the watch can be set in dual time format, which means you can have two separate times displayed. The key thing is that they synchronize themselves through resonance for superb timekeeping. And because it takes about five to 10 minutes for the process to fully take purchase, the seconds hands may be out of sync. So there is a synchronizing mechanism at four o'clock. 38 millimeters uncommon rose with rose gold dial and the rose gold movement means this is triple rose. And because this features the Eleanor French manufactured case with the French hallmarks, but it does not have a year stamp. I know it was made roughly between 2005 and 2008. So rare beast indeed. Um, as Tim mentioned, this is a piece from between 2005 and 2007. So. This watch came shortly after F.P. Journe transitioned from brass movements into rose gold watches, but before the transition into the third type of dial, meaning that it had the 24-hour indicator disc. So really cool watch, still retained at the 38 millimeter size, and not a watch that you really see very often because the red-red's already a rare combination. You know, couple that with that it's a red gold movement and still in the 38 millimeter size, and definitely not a lot of these were made. The interesting thing about the 38 millimeter FP Journe is that it's a little bit like manual transmission Ferraris. Today, if you can find a manual transmission Ferrari 599, you can almost name your price. I've seen them sell for close to half a million dollars. If you have a standard 599 with the auto manual, you're going to wind up paying somewhere around 150,000, 160,000 for that car. Why did they sell so few true manuals if they would later be so collectible? Well, because the primary circuit buyer didn't want 
a manual transmission Ferrari 599. And it's the same thing with the original buyers of these FP Journe watches. Most wanted the 40 millimeter case back in the 2000s, bigger was better. Today, the pre-owned market values the 38 for its rarity and its discretion. Yeah. Right. Okay, so just a couple of shout outs to some of our regulars that are here. Uh, Edward Ledin, JBO Surf, uh, Matt Forster, welcome back guys, and we always appreciate all of you for logging onto the show. And they're from all over the place. Edward Ledin from Sweden, JBO Surf from Adelaide, Australia, and we're gonna take a quick detour to Saxony in yeah. Eastern Germany. And then there's a couple questions from the chat yeah, regarding well, their new, uh, regarding the new sport watch. So why don't we transit, we'll talk a little bit yeah. about this and then we can transition in and maybe answer some questions. Sure. So here we have the Longa moon face in the, you know, standard 38 and a half millimeter size, rose gold case, silver dial, German silver movement, um, as quintessential Longa as it gets. And, you know, what sort of struck me when I was looking at this watch, and, you know, I'm not particularly a Longa fan for the most part, is that I really do like the, the warmth that the rose gold sort of transmutes to the watch itself, both, both the movement and the dial. And I think it adds... Um, a little bit more tone where the platinum pieces I just find to be more stark. It is true that rose gold adds warmth, especially when you have a watch that is already somewhat stolid and sober. I can't say that the Longa one is the most exuberant brand flagship, but what I can say is that it's a heartfelt attempt to offer a very practical, classically handsome and enduring design. And I think as one of the original four Longa designs back in 1994, the Longa one has probably aged the best. Now the additional moon phase gives this one a bit of romance. So it's perhaps a bit more romantic than your average Longa one. In combination with the rose gold, that makes this this one a little bit uncommon, as it does have that emotional edge and extra charm. Now, the disc itself is of solid gold, the dial is of sterling silver, and the case is of rose gold, so Longa is not shorting you the precious metal. The irony is that the movement material, often described as German silver, is not in fact silver in any respect. It is nickel, copper, and zinc, and it's the copper that creates that golden hue. Uh, so for example, if you want to look at something like Swiss rhodium plated brass, which has that silvery sheen. This is very much a material of the wristwatch era, whereas Longa wants to channel the original Alonga Unzona of the 19th century and early 20th century, which made principally pocket watches. As a result, that German silver material is used. You have a three-quarter style bridge. You have jewels set in screw-fixed chiton, the freehand engraved half bridge, the black polished swan's neck, all of this very much like what you would expect on a 19th century East German high-grade pocket watch. And so what's interesting too, and I actually think that what sort of led me to bring this watch on the show is that it reminded me of some of the early longest from the early 90s. And I think that you're going to see definitely the collectability of those pieces appreciate, but mostly the solid case back watches. So for the viewers on our show that don't know, the first watches that were coming out from Longa uh, back in the early 90s did feature solid case backs. And I think that you're definitely going to see those watches become more collectible. And similar to how the early brass FP Journes have become more collectible or the early Roger Dubuis have become more collectible, that, that sort of early to mid-90s type watches where a brand was either getting relaunched or just starting, where it's sort of vintage now, I definitely think you're going to see a run and they're cool pieces to pick up if you can. It's also worth mentioning that they were far scarcer back then, and another factor that's that's in common with that are pre, pre richemont Yes. pre richemont Roger Dubuis from the 1990s. Now, the brand was bought in 2008, so there was plenty of pre richemont mm -hmm. 2000s with Roger Dubuis. But Richemont purchased IWC, Jager LeCoult, and Alonga Unzona in 2000. And remember, that first model year, 1994, for Longa, there were only a few hundred pieces available. Mm -hmm. And while production did increase, not much through, right. the, through the 1990s. Brian right there were solid case backs and those early models are actually worth more but I, I just spoke to Roger Ruger of Watch Time magazine and of course I'm promoting Watch Time New York because I'm gonna be there and having a great time and I hope you join me but the bottom line is that we talked about trends that are gonna merge for 2020 and I think one of them will be the auction scene and the collector scene discovers modern watches. Mm -hmm. 1990s Longa, 1990s Roger Dubuis, early works by independence, and 
with a little bit of investigation, uh, mainstream brand watches that were created by guys like Vincent Calabrese and F.P. Journe and Kerry mm -hmm. Voudelainen during the 90s and the 80s. Yeah, I mean, I think that the collector community and is always looking for undiscovered value. And I think that similar to the Soltorello that we brought onto the show, it, a pre richemont Vacheron, beautiful watch, low production, and the prices are not crazy relative to other more modern watches. And I definitely agree that there's gonna be a run on these watches and you've already started seeing the uptick uh, for a lot of them. And a lot of that too is gonna to be mainstream brands. You're gonna see a lot of interest among the vintage community in 1990s Rolex and Omega and Patek Philippe. It's not just going to be, oh, well, here's a carry from before he was Carrie Voodelainen. You're going to see mainstream brands. Look at the scholarship that's been invested. We have books on, on the shelves. Scholarly texts documenting Rolex watches from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. I think with interest in newer watches, mm -hmm. we're going to start to see some real scholarship. So you can start classifying 90s Rolex dials, and you can start talking about modern watches in the same descriptive terms that we speak of 50 and 60 year old watches now. Yeah, because, you know, no different than, let's call it the level of production of some of these watches from the 50s and 60s. A lot of the brands that are larger today that we know and love had much smaller production in the 90s. IWC, Vacheron, uh, Roger Dubuis were producing anywhere close to the watches that they're producing today back then. That's also true. And it's worth mentioning that there's some brands that are now fairly mainstream that were almost unheard of outside of Europe in the 90s. Zenith is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. 90s Zenith, I think that's going to be a thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Speaking of 90s, let's talk about two 90s pieces we've got on the table right now. So both are watches that I would say fall into that obtainable sport watch that's really cool, that's got a retro vibe. Here we have a Omega Speedmaster, not a reduced, even though it looks like one. This is actually a full 40 millimeter watch produced, I think you said sometime between 95 and 98, is that right? That's correct. And so full tritium dial, chronograph movement, 7750. Yes. And just absolutely spectacular looking, both I think in terms of the aesthetic and the form and the function, and you've got that older Omega Speedmaster vibe, but in a more modern case. The nice thing about this watch is it is not the entry-level timepiece that the Speedy Reduced was. Uh, the Reduced, in many cases, didn't have a date. It was a smaller watch, not a full 40. It featured a plexiglass crystal. This features a sapphire. And the Reduced featured a modular chronograph architecture, whereas this features an Omega 1152, which is a high-grade value 7750, an integrated chronograph caliber. So this was not the entry-level piece that the reduced was. It doesn't look it, it doesn't feel it, and because of its somewhat more substantial case, dial, crystal, bracelet, and size, it's held up better as a watch that still looks contemporary on the wrist in 2019. Now, the nice thing about the dial is that you do have real tritium fade. So you have those lovely Arabic numerals that have aged and they've gained color and intensity and a little bit of an emotional appeal that they wouldn't even have had when they were new. It works really nicely alongside the rather elaborate stamped guilloche pattern of the center and the red varnish of the dial in the hands. So this is a very attractive watch. This is not Fotina. You can also see in profile it's a bit more deluxe than a standard Speedy Reduced as it features a conical profile bezel that's got a little bit more mass to it and a bracelet that's interesting because it's characteristic of a lot of Omega bracelet designs, seemingly designed to sit halfway between a dress watch and a sports watch bracelet architecture. And let's take a look at something that's almost concurrent. So very similar time period, and here we have a watch that is the inspiration for, let's call it one of Breitling's current large flagship lines, the, you know, the original Breitling Premier. Beautiful watch, large luminescent Arabic numerals. You've got rose gold hands, stainless steel case, this particular example comes on, are you looking for a cloth? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, because you look like you're slowly dying there. You know, um, I don't see one, so we're just gonna have okay. to live with it. I will, oh, I will your shirt. Util, I will sacrifice my shirt. <laughs> so, the watch here is featured on an original two-tone bracelet to the watch. Um, particularly, I think what's so cool about this watch is it's got such a crazy look on the two-tone, but you could also throw it, you know, let's say it on a brown suede strap and it would look just as good. I love the pump pushers. I want to say it comes in a what, 36 millimeter? It's 36 about, and a half? It, it's a tweener. It's a 36 and a half. Yeah, so it's a 36 and a half millimeter watch. And honestly, like, I 
dig that the date is in between the four and the five. I think that it fits in really nicely with the dial. And I've wanted one of these for a while. I actually think that this watch, if not a similar one, is is maybe on my radar as my next acquisition. It's really nice because this is kind of a kinder, gentler era of Breitling. And it's also important to note that even when this watch debuted in the mid-1990s, it was considered a little bit of a vintage nod before vintage tributes were truly a thing. Now, it came out around the same time as the great manual wind. Tag Heuer Carrera tribute model, the 1964 of 1996, so they're very much in the same spirit. What I like about this watch is that the dial contains a great deal of nuance. If you look, the registers all feature a vintage-inspired radial orientation of the Arabic numerals, rather than top to bottom like the numerals on the dial. The sub-registers all feature radially arrayed Project Alaska-style numerals that I just love. The hands at center are absolutely to die for. Those rose gold plated hands with a sort of quasi foy or leaf style. They're lovely, vintage, nostalgic, evocative, and emotional. And the dial features an uh, interesting Arabic numeral font with a wonderful border for all of the printed numerals. So they have a depth as well as a definition because of that printed border around the edge of the numerals that makes them more legible. Now there's another feature of this watch that I think is overlooked. It is technically part of the Navitimer family as it featured the Navitimer bracelet. This is the seven link bracelet as opposed to the five link pilot bracelet that you get on a standard chronomat, for example. And if you look at the case back, it does indeed say Navitimer Premier. So what I also find kind of fun with this watch is that you know exactly when the bracelet was made, as before the week and the year stamp Breitling used on its bracelets. Andrew, if you could show the inside of the bracelet, 296. There's a good chance that's exactly when the watch and the bracelet were made. Second quarter of 1996, and that little date stamp is your sign when you're looking at a Breitling from this era of roughly when it was manufactured. Now, if you look Look closely at the crystal, it has a little bit of a foggy off-axis profile, leading me to guess that the crystal might in fact be mineral rather than sapphire, which is another wonderful vintage nostalgic element and one that has since passed from the Breitling catalog, but very emblematic of 1990s Breitling and a wonderful sort of contemporary rival for the similarly sized and similarly arrayed Speedmaster 40. Yeah, no, I mean, I... I love the look and feel of this watch. I just think that it has such an old world uh, vibe to it. And I think that, again, these types of watches offer, you know, just really cool value and, and for a great watch. I would go so far as to say if you've ever wanted such a thing as a Datejust chronograph, this is probably as close as you're going to get in terms of look, size, and feel. I know that's a little bit out of left field, but I kind of got that vibe from yeah. the watch. The big luminescent numbers just... Just do it to, you know, do it for me. I love it. Yeah, that's I a very... It. And I love the gold tone hands on how it just pops from the dial. That's an uncommon watch. As, yeah. as uncommon as 90s Breitling is on this show, that's uncommon among 90s Breitling. Yeah. Okay. So moving right along. Um, and questions? so there's a couple questions just regarding the longest sports watch and what's come out, you okay. know, about the piece and what everybody's thoughts are. So um, I don't think it's been officially launched yet, correct? It's I think supposed there's just, to I come think out there's, tomorrow. 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 Uh, so it's supposed to come out tomorrow, and rumors are definitely leaking out about the watch. Um, so I would say we'll probably wait and see what happens tomorrow, uh, and then I'm sure you'll talk about it on one of your shows, and then we can you know hash it out on the next Wednesday show. Here's what we know so far. It appears to be a day date. There's at least going to be an option for a blue dial. Everyone seems to agree it's going to be in stainless steel and on a full bracelet. And I understand that some individuals in the collector community have already seen the watch. Yeah, so I've, I've heard the same thing. And, you know, I what I did hear is that, as you mentioned, it's a day date. I don't think they're next to each other. Um, and I, I think they're actually, I want to say they're horizontally opposed. Correct. Um, and again, I mean, I think that they're in a tough spot. There was a lot of hype surrounding what they were going to come out with. There's a sports watch craze going on right now. So you're competing against the hype of Rolex, Patek Philippe, and AP. And, you know, in a perfect world, they would have been able to launch this watch without the other brands being so strong. Um, and then sort of figure out where it fits in, what the overall look is going to be. And it's also hard to create something entirely new where... You know what consumers like. You know what they're buying. You're a large enough brand that you can't do something similar to what they're doing because you're just going to get told that you're copying. 
Um, and there's so much that's come out before it with, you know, a steel watch with an integrated bracelet. I mean, everybody's done it. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't envy what they were going to have to do. Um, and I would say initial reactions, um, from what I've heard from people that have seen it have been mixed. So what I've heard is that they're going to try to keep the production relatively constrained out of the gate to keep the buzz alive. It's difficult to release something so far out of the product cycle. Mm -hmm. Look at what they've already passed by. SIHH, pre-Basel, because we know the Richemont brands release stuff just before Basel to try to shade the Basel brands. We also missed watches and wonders in February. Uh, the midsummer cycle when a lot of stuff, for example, came out from Panerai. I would say at the end of the day, this might be a pilot's watch. Some folks are saying that because Langa has a little bit of real mm -hmm. history in the pilot's watch segment, that is the most interesting theory I've heard. I have not seen the watch. It would have been a nice transition and an easier transition for them to sort of move into their current aesthetic, mm -hmm. into maybe a pilot's watch feel, and then eventually doing a bracelet watch. I mean, obviously we know that they're doing a bracelet watch now, but, um, you know, we're going to wait and see what happens. And... Uh, you know, I think that they had an opportunity where, you know, I, I look at them almost in the same vein as an FP Journ in the sense of FP Journ for the most part is this traditional watch with a French aesthetic that's a little bit different, yeah. but he has a sport line. But his sport line is very much to a completely different world. It's it they're started. Bigger, they're, they're, more they're bigger. They're more aggressive. It started out as just titanium or aluminum, and then has sort of transitioned now into the precious metals. But it was really larger titanium and aluminum watches that were very different than what he was producing. He also added that FP Journe flair of saying, "Okay, if I'm going to go sport, I'm going to go all in on sport, and I'm going to do an aluminum movement, which then you know turned into a titanium coated aluminum movement." But I do think that Longa had an opportunity to do something like that to go so different than what they've done that people would say, oh, wow. And, and I would have really liked almost, um, and again, I don't know how it would have translated, but maybe doing a titanium watch, doing something with the Lumen line that was a little bit different avant-garde that was just light years away from what was currently being Keeping produced. Keeping in mind, we don't know what the watch actually looks like. Correct. I, I would say ways they could have been very different. They could have gone with a watch that is not integrated lug and bracelet. Just because you have a steel watch on a bracelet doesn't mean it needs to look like a Nautilus Bell & Ross Chopard. And the bottom line is that Longa has built bracelet watches before, mm -hmm. some of which were actually integrated with the case itself. And just type in integrated case Longa watch, and you will find exactly what I'm speaking of. There have been several generations of Longa bracelets. We don't see them that often, and some of the most committed options for customers were actually those for which only that bracelet would work with that watch and right. no other strap. You know, and they might continue that. They, but to be honest, they, they were left with no choice because if you're a brand nowadays, you need to really be able to encapsulate for the most part, or at least a brand the size of longa right yes. if you're a resistance you can have your particular look you don't need to necessarily so, have a size of watch. longa is about five thousand watches. right so if you're you know but if you're a large international brand that is really you know that wants to have let's call it different categories you know you you draw you lose clients from the brand if you don't have a steel sport watch now or something steel that they can wear on a regular basis you just do so I'm sure that they look at it like, okay, we have Longa clients, we have people that love the brand, that love the aesthetic. They're being, we're, you know, we're almost forcing them to buy Rolex Paddock, AP, or any of these other brands because we just don't have that checkbox to fill that so many people want. That they were almost left with no other option than to come out with it with the watch. I would say Longa also has unique circumstances because if a brand is doing great, there's no need to pander. Like for example. F.P. Journ is able to do his own thing because demand is always strong. There's, there's never a surplus of unsold inventory, and they do a pretty good job of balancing sure. demand against supply. Whereas Longa has the same problem, despite only making 5,000 watches, that every other Richemont brand has, which is more than the market can bear. So you've got a company that only makes dress watches in a market that only wants sports watches, and then you've got all of the overproduction and marketing weakness issues that are kind of endemic to the Richemont group. It's a uniquely 
needy brand at the moment. And, you know, I think the conundrum, though, is that 5,000 is not that many watches. You know, it we, shouldn't be. You know, it should not be. I mean, really, demand should be double or triple that. And, you know, I think that, you know, it, it, you know, it happens to be that Longa as a whole, though, you know, receives a lot of oxygen from the high-end call it collector market or the Northeast market, I think, um, or guys that are really sort of deep in the watch space. But when you start getting more broad out, a lot of folks really haven't even heard of the brand. And, you know, the truth is if Longa made 1,000 watches, they would sell 1,000 watches. I think the big question is, is when you're only making 5,000, what's sort of going wrong? I would even say that the way things are going, if they made a thousand watches, they might not sell. There are a lot of independents, and I'm not going to name names, that are not able to sell the few hundred watches they make each year at list priced. And I think the Longa of 2006, 7, and 8 doesn't even think about building a steel sports watch and pandering to a market that's non-native to the brand. Yeah, but I you know what? I think the Longa of today is in a position where it has to make that compromise. But things change. You know, you know I mean, again, you could say the same thing for... Um, did you ever think that Patek Philippe would come out with a larger green 42 millimeter khaki, or um, a or a 44 or a 44 millimeter 5976 1G, like their their anniversary piece in the larger gold size? So, I think that you know consumer preferences definitely do sort of dictate where a brand may transition into. Um, I, it's almost like it's almost like they're late to the game, so it feels like they're doing it forced, no, as opposed to had they have done it probably three, four years ago, it wouldn't. It'd be a different situation. I still think that the biggest problem with Longa is the outlook people have on the brand because it has always been a connoisseur brand, but it used to be in like six, seven, and eight in the two thousands, the connoisseur brand that people would wait for and pay retail Correct. to own. Today, people who know watches absolutely know Longa, but they know Longa as the best buy in used watches, and they have a permanent mindset fixated Correct. on that conception of the brand, and that is the worst thing a new brand can have. Great watches. But you want to be the second buyer, and that's the problem that they're fighting. And I'm not sure that a steel sports watch alone can combat that notion. No, and and I I I, I I agree. I 100% agree with that. And I think that it's you know it's one step into trying to figure out the new direction that they need to go in. I think a combination of a steel sports watch, oh, and by the way, next year we're only making a hundred of them, would be the first way to show they have a backbone as a brand. Peg back production of everything for two or three years, and then come back after those two or three years and try to rebuild volumes. I think they have to figure out how to make the watches not just desirable, because they're clearly that. We just saw that longer one. It's an incredible mm -hmm. watch. But they need to make the watches watches worth waiting for and not just worth waiting for the second person to own sure no uh, listen I, I i agree and they're 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 tough problems to solve for i would also say they have a stronger brand than the next brand we're going to discuss on the table tonight so well so i thought you were going to talk about the lf but no no so we'll go no. through these quick because we're nearing the end of the show so here we have a frank muller master square um you've got the date at six o'clock this is as Frank Mueller as it gets, and I absolutely love the watch. It's extraordinarily comfortable. The size for me is his small. It's his smaller case size here, um, so it's definitely a transitional watch. I would say that it's a watch that he's definitely made ladies' watch. You know, sort of ladies' watches in this size. I would consider this a men's watch, though. Um, it fits me incredibly well, and I just think that again, coming back to '90s type watches, or let's call it the '90s type look, this watch is just so cool and it's different and you're not going to see it on people's wrists and just the value associated with them is just so good relative to what hyped watch i shouldn't even say hyped watches but what it would cost to buy a watch from a brand as popular as what this brand was nowadays yeah we talked about longa being sort of in its salad days this thing, on my wrist. Yeah, this thing is incredible we're gonna do some brian wrist shots now and his his straps are so thin and supple i just love it and the watch almost has no lugs it's almost just a cushion case yeah and i just again look you look at this watch right here and it just fits incredibly well but it still has an oversized presence on the wrist and it's just I don't know. I think it's incredible. And what's so great about his watches too is the ability to change up straps. You can change up colors. And it's it's definitely got, again, it's got that artistic French flair 
that I think uh, FP Jorn has as well. I would also say realistically, I sort of this alluded to it. This branch should come back. I mean, I, yeah. I just, I think that more than anything else, like, like similar to how brands are collaborating with Alon Silberstein, yeah. I think more brands should be collaborating with Frank Muller. It's got a couple of strikes against it. It was kind of viewed as a, a product of the 90s and a creature of the 90s. And I think more than most brands that had a really good run during that period, uh, Franck Muller struggled to kind of keep pace during the 2000s. The departure of Franck himself probably didn't help things. And there is a little bit of a perception that Franck Muller is sort of a fashion brand. The watches are well made, but if you look at this, for example, uh, you're buying into the image, the fit, which is superb, the quality of the dial in the case. It is an ETA 2892 on the inside, which means it's a very basic automatic movement. One distinction is that Franck did use platinum winding masses, which makes them more efficient winders than standard 2892s. But principally, this is a brand that's sold on style. And it absolutely hit the nail on the head with the original Curvix Centre style, the Casablanca. That was really the image of the brand. And there's a very good reason why Richard Meal started off in 1999 with his first drawings on the board in a tonneau shape. And it was because right. the hottest independent of the 90s was Franck Muller. Correct. And so, and I think that consumers, there's a lot of firsts that happen, right? Or things that happen in the watch community that then trickle out to other brands. So. Frank Mueller comes out with the tonneau shape case, right? Tonneau shape cases are used today and or are popularized, let's call it, with Richard Mill because of Frank Mueller. You've got um, Breitling in the 80s coming out with chronographs. Every single brand after that had chronographs, you know, regularly. So why are there, why does every brand have chronographs today? That was started again by Breitling in the 80s. You've got um, Techno Marine, which we're going to throw in a brand that who knows if people here have heard of, Techno Marine came out with a plastic watch with diamonds on the bezel. And it was a phenomenon, like the Tamagotchi. And you remember those? After that, you had all the other brands coming, Rolex pastel color dials. You had Cartier pastel color dials, Patek Philippe coming out with, again, color dials. And I think that you see brands do things that then have ramifications across the entire industry. And Frank Mueller was just such a brand. And I think getting back to our theme of 90s watches becoming collectible, I do think you'll be looking at interest in 90s Frank Mueller, especially some of the, the watches that are more iconic designs. The grand complications, the so-called world premieres are very cool, but I do think collectors on the vintage scene tend to prefer things that have iconic design first and mm -hmm. movements kind of second. I would not be shocked to see an interest in collecting 90s Frank down the line. Yeah. That said, I like this one better than the Casablanca style case because it just so fits better. This, yeah, I mean it fits. I mean it just fits incredibly well, and um, again, I just uh, I dig it. So okay, so we've got one more watch here on the table. We have any questions we're, we're gonna end the with a bang. Let you know. I think uh, b -b 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 just people commenting on the watch. Um, Okay, I have a watch now that is absolutely not a fashion watch and all about the movement yeah. from a brand that is actually, I would say, probably about to move into a n new period of strength under new management, yeah. Laurent Ferrier. So here we have a Laurent Ferrier Galley Traveler rose gold case. You've got a this uh, dark gray rhodium dial with rose gold accents. Absolutely beautiful. I'm a real fan of the, of the coloring. You know... I think that what's special about his watches, again, he makes, what, a couple hundred watches a year? Yeah, under a thousand. Yeah. So, is it that? It's got to be a lot less than that, isn't it? I mean, he makes far less than F.B. Journe. I think it's only a couple hundred pieces, right? I want to say it's some somewhere between 500 and, like, 900. Is it that much? Oh, well. So, well, the wa again, the watches are, are, are finished incredibly well. I think he's regarded as one of the best finishers in the world. Um, and I just think that he comes out with different variations of his flagship models with really cool, interesting color combinations, which you don't see from a lot of other brands. And we've talked a lot about how difficult it is to do a really, really good traditional watch and or a really, really good traditional time-only watch. And he is one of the few folks that that's really excelled at it. 
I will also say that these watches are remarkably discreet. Not only are they handsome and relatively understated, but you will not find a brand that is more discreet about branding. Most Laurent Ferrier watches force you to squint at the dial to see the name, which is wonderfully tasteful. Rolex, this is how you do it. You don't need to print a tome. And I'll also mention that there's no particular difficulty reading the watch. The contrast to the dial is good. It's just that the name is almost always ghosted in small font. Now, the Traveler is a 41 millimeter timepiece that features, well, a travel time complication. So you've got a 24 hour format second time zone at 9 o'clock, you've got your date over at 3, and then you've got a sort of Patek Philippe inspired plus minus travel time system, and that's no coincidence, says Laurent Ferrier was a complication specialist at Patek Philippe. Turn the watch over and the movement is gorgeous. Now this is where I really find that the romance of Laurent Ferrier watches localized on the case back. Uh, combination of a micro rotor with a guilloche cut 22 carat mass, pauls and a jeweled staff for silent winding, and then it is a three day power reserve. It features a double direct impulse unlubricated escapement inspired by Breguet's natural escapement. So you have twin nickel phosphorus escape wheels directly impulsing the balance only in its direction of travel, 21 six beat rate overcoil adjusted in six positions and beautifully executed with, sh with chamfered bevels so broad and bright that you don't don't need a loop to appreciate the anglage on this watch. You could see that the Cote de Genève is deeply ridged, darker on one side and lighter on the other. That's real Cote de Genève, not stamped. And then you could see interior angles at the center, over the center wheel, and four inside the skeletonized half bridge for the balance. I'll also advise you to appreciate that the bridge for the winding mess is itself a work of art. Everything on this movement is finished to the highest level. And one of the keys with Laurent Ferrier is that the company works with suppliers who can execute at this level, namely La Fabrique du Temps, also located out of Geneva, technically an LVMH company, but old friends with Laurent Ferry and his son Christian, they have been actual partners in the design of the in-house calibers right since the beginning. The exclusive calibers used by Laurent Ferry almost always feature the fingerprints of La Fabrique du Temps alongside. A watch that's wonderful to wear too. Yeah, no, and I'm a big fan of his straps. I really like the micro suede that they put on, uh, you know, underneath. Is it micro suede or is it Alcantara? What is it? I, I believe what they're using is an actual, I believe it's an Alcantara. Yeah, Alcantara. Because Laurent Ferry himself was a race car driver, and Alcantara is a sort of super durable premium synthetic suede that is used in the contact points of high performance cars, such as steering wheels, shift knobs, and of course headliners, and also racing gloves. It is a very high end piece of material. You may ask why synthetic suede? Go ahead and spec an Alcantara headliner in your Porsche and tell me, tell me that it was cheap. It's, it's monstrously expensive stuff. So that watch is no compromise. The only thing I will say about that watch is it is a collaborative effort with La Fabrique du Temps brought in and almost all of the parts sourced through good suppliers. Mm -hmm. It's a study in what used to be called etablissage in the Swiss industry, where the best parts are brought in and then assembled under the name of the brand. So it's a little bit different from FP Journe, but I actually like that because that's a nostalgic old world Swiss way. Mm -hmm. It's just a different approach. Yeah. So I think that's all that we have for tonight. Um, again, guys, please, um, as mentioned, uh, if you'd like to join Chim in watch time or if you have any questions, you can reach out to him directly. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions about anything you saw on the show, please feel free to email myself or Tim. And if there's anything that you want to uh, talk about on the show, specific topics or watches that you want brought on the show, again, uh, we do this for you guys and always happy to uh, do what we can. So We again, take requests. Yeah. So my name is Brian. I'm Tim. This is The Watch Insider, and thank you for logging on.